Hello, this video is going to cover chapter 10 of our introductory chemistry class. Uh, this chapter is called chemical bonding. So we're going to talk about the different types of bonds and um, a, a few different ways to classify them. And then once and we're going to talk about how to draw them and then the 3D shapes associated with them um, and then just some of the characteristics that go along with them. So we've seen multiple theories to describe the same thing in a couple other chapters. And this chapter has that as well. We're going to talk about a couple different bonding theories. So these are going to explain how our atoms are bonding together to create molecules. And one of this slide's kind of explaining why we talk about it. Um, Atoms form bonds in order to create molecules, and there's a couple reasons why we study this, but one of the big ones is that we want to know how these molecules are interacting with each other, and one of the theories we're going to use in this video is looking at the shapes of these molecules. Knowing the shapes helps us understand how they can interact with each other. So the pictures that are on here, I took these from a journal of pharmacology and it was describing shape and drug interactions. And so it used that toy in the first picture to kind of illustrate the idea that certain pieces will only go into certain openings. In the picture labeled B, the orange and black, red and blue are four different proteins, but they're able to fit together because they have a very specific shape. And then in picture C, it is showing a molecule that is bonded onto a protein. And again, it's only able to fit there because it has this very specific shape. A big part of pharmacology and, and drug chemistry is knowing the shapes of molecules and how they're going to interact with different proteins and different areas within our bodies. So we will eventually get to the shapes of molecules, but we do need to start at the beginning. And the beginning is called Lewis structures. So this is using our first theory, which is called Lewis theory. And in Lewis structures, we are showing the, we're representing the atom by drawing the symbol for the atom, the letter or letters, and that's representing the nucleus and the core electrons. And then we use dots going around the symbol to represent the valence electrons. Remember that the column number tells us how many valence electrons there are for all of those main group elements. So starting at the far left of our periodic table, so starting way over here, this is one valence electron, two, and then three three, four, five, six, seven, eight is the maximum. And speaking of eight being the maximum, when an element has eight valence electrons, we give this a special name. It's called an octet. And I realized that there is a typo on this slide. So we're gonna cross off halogen. These are our noble gases. Now there is one exception to this. Helium doesn't have that many electrons. It's not that big. So helium has what we refer to as a duet. It just has two electrons around it. So we can see the example of our Lewis structures of the atoms on the bottom there, going from lithium with its one valence electron all the way across the row of that periodic table getting all the way over to neon with eight. Now notice when the electrons are put, in, put around the symbol, we start with just one on each side. So notice carbon has one on each side and then nitrogen with that fifth valence electron, that's when we start to pair them up. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, and then that fifth one gets paired and so on. Lewis theory says that chemical bonds are happening because it's allowing the atoms to have the most stable electron configuration. And this is gonna happen two different ways. They can transfer electrons, meaning 
one atom can give its electrons to another atom and this will cause uh, cause them to have charges so we know that our um, cations are positive and our anions are negative and this is happening because our atom is giving those electrons over and it's creating those charges now this is happening so that the cation and the anion now have the most stable electron configurations possible it can also happen by sharing electrons and this is called a covalent bond and by sharing those electrons again they can end up with a stable configuration the goal is to have an octet so when we look back i'm going to go back to right here we know that fluorine likes to have a negative one charge notice that it has seven electrons when it gains that extra electron it now has eight electrons and it ends up with an octet so the reasoning behind the charges that we've discussed are to get to that octet of course there's some exceptions to this rule we'll talk about some of them it's definitely going to be a minor part of this class though when we draw the lewis symbols of the ions we either have to remove electrons if it's a cation or we have to add electrons if it's an anion so for our cations we're really just drawing them without any valence electrons so here's lithium as a neutral atom with its one electron lithium forms a one plus charge so in order to do that that means that it needs to lose one electron so to draw its Lewis symbol as an anion, as a cation, we just draw it with its charge. Anions are going to gain electrons. So when we draw our anion, we're going to draw it with the extra electrons it has gained. So here's our fluorine as a neutral atom. When it becomes an anion, it's going to gain one electron. So we draw it with its extra electron. We draw it with its charge. And then the extra thing that we're doing is we're putting it in brackets. So cations, no electrons, give it a charge. Anions, it gets the extra electron or electrons, depending on what charge it has. It gets the charge and we're going to put the whole thing in brackets. So let's practice a couple of these. We're going to draw the Lewis structure of a neutral chloride, chlorine atom and chloride with a charge. So I'm looking at my periodic table and I know that chlorine has seven valence electrons. So there's my chlorine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. So if chlorine has seven electrons and we have that one minus charge that means it's gaining an electron so i know that it has eight electrons one two three four five six seven whoops eight put the whole thing in brackets and give it a charge strontium is in the second column so i know that that means it has two valence electrons one two that's it and in order for strontium to have a two plus charge those are the original electrons we're going to subtract that charge so now it has no electrons but it has a charge so here are oh there we go there's my answers we said that there's two types of bonds ionic and covalent and um, about half of this we already have talked about we know ionic bonds are generally metals to nonmetals. Uh, the metals are going to lose electrons in order to form cations the nonmetals are going to gain electrons to form anions and that ionic bond is that positive to negative attraction
these two pieces of information are going to come into play in later chapters, but it says a larger charge is a stronger attraction and a smaller ion is a stronger attraction. So the larger charge means that strontium 2 plus and um, sulfur 2 minus have a stronger attraction than Na Na plus and Cl minus. So because they have a charge of 2, 2 plus and 2 minus, that makes it stronger. So think of it like a stronger magnet holding them together. And then the smaller ion um, is because they can get closer together. So when there's less bulky stuff in the way, they are able to get closer together. And I always think of this as putting things on your refrigerator. The magnet and the refrigerator are attracted to each other. If you try and hang something on the refrigerator that's really thick, they aren't going to stick as well together. There's just too much bulkiness in the way. So Lewis theory says that we're going to move the electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. So we're going to look at an example of this and then we're going to practice it. So we're going to draw the, the ionic compound between chlorine and calcium and we're also going to use Lewis theory to predict the formula of it. So we're going to start by drawing the symbols. So there's the Lewis dot structure for calcium. Oh, this is just going to start. Let's see. Let's do that. We're going to draw the Lewis dot symbols for the elements. So we have calcium and chlorine. So we know that calcium is our metal and chlorine is our nonmetal. So I know that the electrons are going to go in this direction. I'm going to transfer my electrons from the calcium to the chlorine. And just by looking at it, we know calcium needs to get rid of two electrons and chlorine wants to gain one electron. So we start by doing some transferring. We're going to transfer one electron over to calcium, from calcium to chlorine, but it still needs to get rid of another electron. So we bring in another chlorine and calcium is able to transfer the other electron over to the other chlorine. And so these are the symbols of the ions that we are, that we've created. We have our calcium 2 plus and we have our two chloride anions. And so that, see if I can circle just that, this would represent the Lewis structure of that molecule. It's showing the structures of those ions and that's showing the Lewis structure. The formula then would be which elements we use and their quantities. And remember, we always put the cation first. So CaCl2. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to draw the Lewis structure of lithium with sulfur and then nitrogen with magnesium. And again, I have my periodic table. And my periodic table tells me that lithium has one valence electron and sulfur has six. So here's my lithium. Here's my sulfur, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I need to do some transferring. So I'm going to take this little electron and I'm going to put it right there. But we know that sulfur wants to have one more electron. So that means I need another lithium in the mix. So I'm going to take that electron and transfer it right there. So what we end up with is a lithium with a one plus charge, a lithium with a one plus charge, and a sulfur with eight electrons with an octet surrounding it, and a two minus charge because it gained two electrons. So we end up with Li2S. So if we do the same thing with nitrogen, again, I look at my periodic table, and nitrogen's in the fifth column, so that means it has five valence electrons, and magnesium is in the second with its two valence electrons. So magnesium, one, two. Nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five. And then I can do some transferring. So I'm gonna take that guy, put him right there. I'm gonna take that one, put him right there. So I've made a magnesium two plus, because it lost two electrons, but my nitrogen still needs another electron in that location right there. So I'm going to 
use another magnesium. So I'm going to take that electron and put it right there. So we just made a nitrogen and it has a three minus charge. And then you erase that charge, it should be outside my brackets. I didn't quite leave myself enough space. There we go. But my magnesium still needs to get rid of another electron, so I need one more nitrogen. This will end, I promise. There we go. So we just made another magnesium two plus. But again, the nitrogen isn't complete, so we have one more magnesium. Oh good, so now we have another magnesium and we've also completed another nitrogen. So we had to get that ratio correct. And so what we end up with is Mg3N2. Now we know this already because if we go back and look at the charges that we know for these two atoms, we know that we can do our cross rule and we would get Mg3N2. So this isn't really telling us something that we don't already know. It's just giving us a little bit more explanation as to why it works. So that, that was it for ionic bonds. The ionic bonds are definitely the smaller part of the chapter because the rest of the entire chapter is talking about covalent bonds. So we're gonna switch gears, look at covalent bonds, and what we know about covalent bonds is that they're between two nonmetals. We find them in molecular compounds, so they're often called covalent compounds because they contain covalent bonds. Um, and it's not wrong, it's, it's just a different name for them. So molecular compounds contain covalent bonds. Um, they have a very strong attraction and covalent bonds happen when atoms share electrons in order to get to that octet or that duet. So hydrogen likes to form a duet just like helium. So here's our example of some atoms sharing electrons. So our oxygen in the middle there has its octet. It has two, four, six, eight electrons all the way around it. And then if we look at each hydrogen, this hydrogen has a duet and this hydrogen has a duet. And the electrons that are in that overlapping zone are being shared by the oxygen and the hydrogen. So the ones that I have circled right now, that is representing a covalent bond because those are the shared electrons. Oh, sorry, there we go. Um, a couple extra words that we need to know. When we share those electrons, those electrons are called a bonding pair, and we represent them with a line, and each line is two electrons. So we often refer to our electrons in pair form. So in order for a bond to happen, it has to be the sharing of a pair of electrons. And electrons that belong to one atom are called a lone pair, and these are also called non-bonding electrons because they're not creating a bond. And we represent them with dots. So this is my bond, my bonding pair of electrons, and that is my lone pair. And having them represented differently, so a line versus a dot, helps you see the difference between them. Some, some websites, videos, books, whatever, or maybe even other teachers, will tell you to just do dots all the way around, whether it's a bond or a lone pair. Um, it definitely helps you see the difference if you draw them with a line instead of just dots. There are three types of covalent bonds. The first one is called a single covalent bond. And all of these bonds are based off of how many pairs of electrons are being shared. 
So a single covalent bond is a single pair of electrons. So one pair of electrons, and we represent it with one line. So here's the pair of electrons that the fluorines are sharing, and we represent that with that one line. And right here, are the Lewis structures of the individual atoms. We can see that they each have seven valence electrons. So if they each share those two electrons right there, they will end up with having eight or that octet each. So that's why they're forming that covalent bond. That's why they're sharing those electrons so that they can each have a full octet. So if we're starting with single covalent bonds, next comes double. A double covalent bond is when the atoms are sharing two pairs of electrons or a double pair of electrons, and this is represented by two lines. It is shorter and stronger than a single bond. So down here, we have the Lewis structures of two oxygen atoms. They each have six valence electrons which means they each want two more. So if they take each of their unpaired electrons and share them, we've created this double bond, and now they each have two, four, six, eight electrons surrounding them, and they have that full octet. Which takes us to our last type, a triple covalent bond. And you could probably guess this, but a triple covalent bond is when we share a triple pair of electrons, or three pairs of electrons. It is shorter and stronger than a single or double bond, so this is the shortest and the strongest. So if we make a little list here, we have triple, double, single. This is the shortest and the strongest, this is the longest, and the weakest. And if we look at our example, our nitrogen, each of our nitrogens have five valence electrons. There are three that are unpaired. So if we share those three, we end up with this triple bond in between them, and we will get our eight electrons. So if we count what this nitrogen has two, four, six, eight, and we look at the other nitrogen, two, four, six, eight, they each have that full octet by sharing those six electrons in the middle. Now there's some common bonding patterns. Now notice the phrase that's used on here common bonding patterns. I point that out because it's not a theory, it's not a law, it's not even a rule. These are just ways that we often see our atoms forming bonds, and it can help you when you're trying to draw out a structure. So carbon will often form four bonds, and if you go back and look at the Lewis structures of just the atoms, the the electrons that are unpaired are going to be the ones that are being shared. So carbon has four unpaired electrons. That's what gets shared. Nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five. Nitrogen tends to form three bonds and have one lone pair. So here's my unpaired electrons that can form bonds, and there's my lone pair. Oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oxygen tends to form two bonds and two lone pairs. So there's a really nice pattern here that we see based off of our Lewis structures of the atoms and the way that they form bonds. Okay, so we are gonna talk about how to do this, and then we're gonna practice one as well, or practice a couple as well. Um, and we're gonna just kind of do one as an example.
So I'm going to start with CF4. And what we're doing on these next couple slides is figuring out how to draw a Lewis structure. So step number one says we're going to draw the atoms in a skeletal structure. So we're not connecting anything together. We're not actually drawing the bonds. We're really just kind of getting the shape correct. So it says we're going to put the most metallic element in the center. So we learned this in the end of last chapter. But if we look at our periodic table, we're dealing with just our nonmetals. So really this just means whichever one is closer to the stairs, whichever one is closer to the other metals is going to go into the middle. So that's going to be carbon. I'm going to put my fluorines around it. A um, couple other rules on here. Halogens and hydrogens are terminal, meaning that they're on the edges. They're only going to be bonded to one other thing. Many molecules tend to be symmetrical. So even just by looking at my formula here, carbon with four fluorines, that tells me that my carbon's in the middle and it's surrounded by the fluorines. Use that symmetry thing to your advantage. And then the last one, it doesn't apply here, but we'll use it in an example in a little bit. It says in oxyacids, so remember that's a hydrogen with a polyatomic. The acid hydrogens are attached to an oxygen. So we'll, we'll use that in, in a little bit. Step number two says calculate the total number of valence electrons available for bonding. So carbon has four valence electrons and there's one carbon. Fluorine has seven valence electrons and there's four of them. So this is the number of valence electrons, and this is the quantity of that type of atom. So that means I have 32 valence electrons altogether. So I'm going to redraw what I had. And I know I have 32 electrons. Now we're going to use those 32 electrons. We're going to start by placing two electrons between our atoms. I'm going to switch color so it stands out a little bit. And now as I do this, I need to subtract the electrons that I used. So I just used 2, 4, 6, 8. So that means I have 24 electrons left. We're going to add electrons in pairs, and we're going to start with the terminal atoms and then go to the central atom if we have electrons left over. And our goal again is octets. So each fluorine has two electrons because of the bonding pair, so that means that they each need six more. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Kind of looks like I'm making flowers because I have green bonds look like green stems very nerdy flowers huh all right so i used six electrons on each fluorine there's four fluorines so i just used 24 electrons which means i'm all out of electrons so i'm out of electrons i'm going to go on to the next step which also means i need to redraw what i just did Step number four says, if atoms don't have an octet, create a double or a triple bond. So we know each of our fluorines have an octet. We, we made those and we double checked them. So that means we, we definitely want to double check our center atom, our, our carbon in this case. So we look at what's surrounding our carbon. We have those four bonds. They are each made up of two electrons, two, four, six eight so carbon also has that full octet so we don't need a double or a triple bond for this molecule we're using double and triple bonds when we run out of electrons and step number five is everyone happy um, so this is really looking at does everybody have an octet or maybe just a duet if that's all they need it's really just kind of a double check your answer but that is our Lewis structure for CF4.
So we're going to practice this with three other molecules. So the first one is COH2. So step number one is we're going to make our skeletal structure. And that means my carbon's going to go in the middle because it's the most metallic. And I'm just going to put my oxygens and my hydrogens around it. It doesn't really matter how. Number two, we're going to figure out how many valence electrons we have to work with. Um, oxygen has six valence electrons and there's one oxygen. Hydrogen each has one valence electron and there's two hydrogens. And carbon has four valence electrons and there's one carbon. So all together, I have 12 electrons. Number three is that we're going to make bonds and lone pairs. We're going to distribute those electrons. So I'm going to start with bonds. So I have 12 electrons. I just used six of them. So that means I have six left. So then I'm going to use my electrons to make lone pairs. So I'm going to look at the hydrogens. Hydrogens only want to have a duet, and they already have that because of the bond. So hydrogens are happy, done, we don't need to do anything to them. So I'm going to move on to the oxygen. Our oxygen has a bond already, so that means it needs six more electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we're out of electrons. Step number four is double and triple bonds if needed. So we know the hydrogens and the oxygen are happy. They all have their duet or their octet. So we look at our central atom and our carbon has two, four, six electrons around it. Our carbon is not happy. So that means we're going to create a double bond. And in order to do that, we're going to take a lone pair from our terminal atom, our oxygen, and we're going to move it right there. So I'm going to redraw this up here. So now I have a double bond going between my carbon and my oxygen. So if I count my electrons, for the carbon, the carbon has two, four, six, eight. And if I count my electrons for the oxygen, two, four, six, eight. So that leads us to number five, is everybody happy? And so now by creating that double bond, we've created an octet on each of our atoms. And yes, every atom is happy. I'm redrawing it without circles. There you go. So that would be my final answer right there. Now if you drew it like this, that's completely okay too. If you drew your oxygen pointing down or to the left, that's okay as well. How they're arranged on paper, whether it's the same as mine or different, that's not going to make it right or wrong. All right, we're going to do the same thing, just new molecule. So step number one is our skeleton. We have H2SO4. This is an oxyacid. So I'm going to put my sulfur in the middle. It's the most metallic. I'm going to put my four oxygens around it. This gives it some symmetry. And then I'm going to put my hydrogens next to those oxygens because that was one of our rules with making our skeleton. Rule number two, we add up our valence electrons. One for each hydrogen, and there's two hydrogens. Six for each sulfur, there's one sulfur. Six for each oxygen, and there's four oxygens. So all together, 32 electrons. Rule number three, we distribute those electrons. One, two, Three, four, five, six. I made six bonds. Each of those are two electrons. So I just used 12 electrons. So that leaves me with 20 electrons.
So I'm going to start with my terminal atoms. My Both of my hydrogens are good. They already have duet. So I'm going to move on to the oxygens on the top and the bottom. They have one bond each, so two electrons each. That means they need six more. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that means I just used 12 more. I got eight to go. So I'm gonna look at those other oxygens. They each have two, two bonds. So two, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now that oxygen has an octet and that oxygen has an octet, and I just used two, four, six, eight electrons. So I am all out of electrons. So our next rule is our double and triple bond rule. We look at the only atom we haven't talked about, and that's sulfur, and sulfur has those four bonds going around it, so it has its octet, so we don't need our double and triple bonds, which also answers our last question then, is everybody happy? And yes, this looks like a good structure for our sulfuric acid molecule. All right, last example in this section is a polyatomic ion. Um, there's one extra thing we need to do with this. Well, maybe a couple extra things, but the other rules are still gonna be in place. So first we draw our skeleton, carbon in the middle, oxygens around it. We're gonna add up our electrons, four, for carbon, and there's one carbon, six for oxygen, and there's three oxygens. Here's one of the different things. Our carbonate has a two minus charge. We need to incorporate that in to our number of valence electrons. So if it has a two minus charge, that means it has two extra electrons. So I'm adding in two over there to be to represent that charge. So four plus 18 plus two gives us 24. So now we're gonna distribute those electrons. Two, four, six. And then I'm gonna use my lone pairs. So each of my oxygens has one bond. That means they each need six more electrons. Two, four, six. Two, four, six, two, four, and six. So six times three gives us our 18, and we are out of electrons. So we check our center carbon there, and our carbon only has six electrons going to it with those three bonds. So I'm going to borrow a pair of electrons. Now notice that there's three oxygens to choose from. I could choose any one of these and it would be correct. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on as well. So I'm gonna go from right here and I'm gonna move those electrons right there. So I'm gonna redraw my structure. So the other two oxygens don't change at all. I'm gonna draw those first. And then my other oxygen now has that double bond and instead of having three pairs of lone pairs, it only has the two. Now, I said that there's a couple things we have to do different because it's a polyatomic ion. The first thing was that charge. Here's the second thing. We're gonna put this entire structure in brackets and then put the charge on the outside. So just like we did that with our anions, um, our single atom anions, we have to do it with our polyatomic anions as well. But there we go, that's our final structure. And we can double check our atoms to make sure they have that full octet. So our carbon now has two, four, six, eight, and our oxygen, two, four, six, eight. And our other two oxygens, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. So everybody has their full octets and are happy. Um, a few slides ago, I did mention that there's some exceptions to the octet rule. We've already talked about one, hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to form a duet. Boron is another one. Um, boron only wants to form three bonds. So something like BH3 
that is a stable, happy molecule. Uh, boron is a smaller atom, and so it doesn't need all four bonds. It doesn't need that full octet to be stable. So less than an octet. The next one is more than an octet, which is also called an expanded octet. So there's a couple examples over here, and there's not really a whole lot you need to know about this for this class. Um, they're using their empty d orbitals in order to do this, but really you're going to talk about this more in general chemistry. And then the last one is an odd number of electrons. So you might have noticed that everything we talked about in those example problems had an even number of electrons, but if with NO here, nitrogen has five valence electrons and oxygen has six, so we get 11, two, four, six, eight, 10, 11, you're never going to be able to get a full octet with an odd number. So nitrogen has two, four, six, seven. If we shared another pair, it would have nine. So it can't have the eight. It would either have seven or nine. So it's not common. Um, in fact, an unpaired electron like this is called a radical. Um, and they're very reactive. So it's not common, but it does occur. Now remember that CO3 molecule, and I said we could have drawn that double bond going to any of those three options. So here's our CO3, our carbonate anion, drawn a little neater than what I did. But notice that our triple bond is rotating between our three different options. This is called resonance. So when there's more than one good Lewis structure, that tells us that the molecule has resonance. And for carbonate, we can say that it has three resonance structures. So this right here, these are the three resonance structures of carbonate. In real life, the actual molecule of carbonate looks like an average of these three, and it's called a resonance hybrid, so an average or a hybrid of those three that actually exist. All right, we're gonna switch over from our flat drawings to 3D shapes. And this is actually our our second theory in this chapter. So the first theory is Lewis theory, and that's drawing Lewis structures. The second theory is called the Vesper theory, and Vesper stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. And this theory is going to give us names for the three-dimensional shapes of the molecules. Uh, it's based off of the fact that electrons repel other electrons. And so as we're deciding what shape a molecule has, we're counting how many electron groups are around the central atom. And an electron group can be a lone pair or a bond. A single, double, or triple bond is going to count as one electron group. So these are one electron group each. And a lone pair is also one electron group. Um, we're also going to talk about bond angles within, within a shape. Now I'm going to go through each of these and show you an example, uh, but there's also a really good summary table in your chapter, and I do have it on um, the slide at the end of these as well. So it will be a good reference as you're working on worksheets and homework. So our first shape is based off of two electron groups. So if you're asked what is the geometry of the, of the molecule, you actually have to draw the Lewis structure first. So here's our Lewis structure down here. And when we look at our central atom, we have a double bond on each side. So those are our two electron groups. And we break that down. We want to know how many of those are bonding groups and how many of those are lone pairs. And remember, we're only looking at the central atom. So all of these are based off of our central atom. And for this molecule, 
There are two bonding groups and no lone pairs. And we have two different geometry names. We have the molecular geometry and the electron geometry. These two are going to be the same if there aren't any lone pairs. Now, if there's lone pairs, then the molecular geometry is going to be slightly different. So the molecular geometry is just based on atoms but the electron geometry is including the lone pairs in the name of the shape. The angle is talking about the angle going from a terminal atom to the central atom back to a terminal atom. So it's looking at this angle right here and for a linear shape it is 180 degrees. So you need to know both names and that bond angle. The numbers that are in there are a way for you to get to that geometry. Next up is three electron groups. So here's our Lewis structure down here. We look at that center carbon and it has three electron groups surrounding it and they are all bonding groups. There's no lone pairs on that center atom. So because there's no lone pairs on that center atom, our molecular, let me move myself, there we go. Our molecular geometry is trigonal planar and our electron geometry is also trigonal planar. The bond angle here, so again, we're going from terminal to central to terminal, so it's this angle, it is 120 degrees. So we are still looking at a molecule that has three electron groups. So here is our Lewis structure. So we have one, two, three electron groups surrounding that central sulfur atom. Two of them are bonding groups. One of them is a lone pair. So this is our first geometry that has a lone pair on our center atom. The electron geometry is trigonal planar. This is based off of this number. So notice, right, here, we had three electron groups with an electron geometry of trigonal planar. So this is part of the trigonal planar family. Because one of those electron groups is a lone pair though, when we just look at the atoms, the molecular geometry is called bent. And so our ball and stick model over here is representing that shape and our geometry is 120 degrees, which is the same angle as the last one, that 120 and trigonal planar go together. Next is four electron groups. So here is my Lewis structure, one, two, three, four, no lone pairs, so our molecular and electron geometry are both the same, tetrahedral, and our bond angle is 109.5, which seems very specific, but that's as far away from each other as they can get within that shape. So we're gonna stick in that tetrahedral family, meaning we're looking at another Lewis structure with four electron groups, but this time one of them is a lone pair. So we do still have the electron geometry of tetrahedral, but this time our molecular geometry is trigonal pyramid. It's also sometimes called um, trigonal pyramidal. Let's see, I'm gonna pause it and see what our book calls it. So I did check and our book calls it trigonal pyramidal, just so you know. Um, and then our bond angle here, it is in that tetrahedral family, so it has the same bond angle as the last slide, that 109.5. So we're going from there to there to there, 109.5. And then our last one, again, we're looking at a Lewis structure with one, two, three, four electron groups, so that means we're still in that tetrahedral family, but this time two of them are lone pairs, 
So here's our ball and stick model of that, which means we get a bent shape. Now this isn't exactly the same as the last bent shape because it does have a different bond angle. So it's unfortunate that they have the same name, but it does have the same name. Here's our good summary table. So notice the way that this is divided up. This has all of the exact same information that we just looked at. We have electron, let's try that again. We have electron groups and then bonding groups versus lone pairs. So if you add these two up, it will equal the first column. We have the electron geometry and then the molecular geometry. So notice there's also some families. So we have the linear family, the trigonal planar, and then the tetrahedral. So the trigonal planars have three electron groups, and the tetrahedrals have four electron groups. And then their molecular geometry is going to vary based off of how many lone pairs they have, but they also share bond angles. And then there's an example for each one of them on the side. So we're going to practice a couple of these. Determine the electron and molecular geometry of, so we're going to start with SIF4. So we do have to draw our Lewis structures. So I'm going to draw these Lewis structures a little bit faster than what we did on the last slide because we want to focus on geometry here. So we're going to start with S, oh, sorry, that was my arm that did that. We're going to start with SI in the middle and then our four fluorines around it. And SI is going to give us four electrons and my fluorines, seven each times four is 28. So 32 altogether, two, four, six, eight. One, two, oh, I did not do that math right, did I? Let's be 24. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, and I can check my center atom, my silicon. I know that it has four bonds going to it, so it has that full octet tappy, it's good. So to answer the geometry question, I can go right back here. I have four electron groups and no lone pairs so that tells me that my electron and molecular geometry are both tetrahedral so four electron groups tells me that the electron and molecular geometries are tetrahedral So what about SCl2? So I'm going to put my sulfur in the middle. My chlorine provides six electrons. My sulfur provides six electrons. Each chlorine is seven. There's two of them, so it's 14. 14 plus six gives us our 20. I've already used four because of the bonds I made, so I have 16 left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I have four left over, and I actually don't think we've had this as an example yet, but my terminal atoms have a full octet, and I still have four electrons over, so they go on the central atom. One, two, three, four. So I can check my octets. Each of my chlorines have two, four, six, eight, and my sulfur has two, four, six, eight. So we have four electron groups with two lone pairs because again remember we're just looking at the the central atom so four electron groups with those two lone pairs tells me that my electron geometry is tetrahedral and my molecular geometry is bent so um, electron geometry tetrahedral molecular is bent. All right, last example on this slide is HCN. So I know my hydrogen has to be on the end. Carbon is more metallic than nitrogen, so it goes in the middle. 
hydrogen plus carbon plus nitrogen gives us 10. I've already used four, so we're left with six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon is definitely not happy. So we're gonna take those electrons, put them right there. Carbon's still not happy. Two, four, six, so I'm gonna take those electrons and put them right there. So we made a triple bond. Carbon has two, four, six, eight. Now with that structure, we only have two electron groups surrounding that carbon. With two electron groups, my electron and molecular geometry are both linear. So practice drawing those Lewis structures and that will get you to the right number of electron groups, which will then get you to your geometries. All right, last topic in this chapter is to discuss um, polarity. Now to get to a discussion about polarity, we have to talk about electronegativity. And electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons specifically within a polar bond and or within a covalent bond, kind of jumping the gun there. When we're looking at a periodic table, and this is can add to our trends we've already talked about, as we go across a row, across a period, it's going to increase. As we go down a column, it's going to decrease. So fluorine has the highest electronegativity. When we have a difference in electronegativity within a covalent bond, we call it a polar bond. And there's a couple different ways that we can we can represent this. One is with partial charges, and so that's what these are right here. And so we do that by using a lowercase delta and then either a plus or a minus. The one that's more electronegative gets the negative sign. We can also represent it with a dipole moment and that's this arrow over here. So our arrow is going to have kind of a plus sign on the end of it and that's at the less electronegative side and then it's going to point at the atom where the electrons are going towards the one that is more electronegative. So here's our, our little chart of electronegativity. It's on a scale of four. So fluorine has the highest electronegativity up there and you can see there's a nice um, diagonal trend going across the periodic table. we can use this to label bond types. So when we're looking at the difference in electronegativity between bonds, we kind of have two extremes so far. We can say that the electrons are transferred, so we, we label that as an ionic bond, and we can say the electrons are shared. But there's kind of this gray area in between where the electrons are being shared, but not being shared equally. So we can figure out where a bond falls by comparing the electronegativity of the atoms. If the difference in electronegativity is between, between 0 and 0.4, then we label it as a pure covalent bond. If the difference is between 0.4 to 2, then it is a polar covalent bond. And this is when it has the charges, we can draw in a dipole moment, and then if the charge is, or the difference is greater than two, then that's when we can label it as an ionic bond. So we're gonna look at a couple examples here and decide what category they fall into. So iodine and iodine. Iodine has an electronegativity of 2.5. So 2.5 minus 2.5 gives us a zero. So we know that this is a pure covalent bond. And we would actually know that without doing the math because two of the same atoms are always going to fall into that pure covalent category. Phosphorus and oxygen. Phosphorus is 2.1, oxygen is 3.5. So 3.5 minus 
gives us 1.4. This falls under the polar covalent category. So if we have a bond between phosphorus and oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative. So I'm going to put my partial negative there, partial positive there, and my dipole moment would go towards that oxygen. And cesium and bromine, cesium is a 0.7, bromine is a 2.8. So 2.8 minus that 0.7 gives us a 2.1. So that tells us that this is an ionic bond. So we know that um, this is a metal and a non-metal, so this isn't a surprise. And we know that cesium would have a plus and bromine would have a minus. So not partial charges, but full charges. Um, the next step, and this is our, our last topic, there's just a, a couple slides left here, is whether or not a molecule is polar. And this is something we're going to use in a later chapter as well. In order for a molecule to be polar, two things have to be true. The first is that it has to have polar bonds. And so that means that our polarity difference needs to be between 0.4 and 2. So we saw that on our last slide. The second one is that it has to have an unsymmetrical shape. And there's two ways that this can happen. Either there's a lone pair on a center atom, or we have different types of atoms attached to that center atom. So there's a couple examples over here on the right. And the book talks about using vectors and adding vectors up. Um, which is something that if you end up taking a physics class you'll do or a higher level math class, but you don't even need to think about it that way. So the structures that are on here, we have linear, we have a trigonal planar, and we have a tetrahedral, but notice those are all labeled as nonpolar. But when we have a bent shape or a trigonal pyramidal shape, these are labeled as polar because they have a lone pair on that center atom or two lone pairs on that center atom. So let's look at a couple examples. We have water and carbon dioxide. So water, when we want, we're trying to answer the question, is it a polar molecule? Water has polar bonds, so it checks the first box, and it's unsymmetrical because there's, because there's lone pairs on the oxygen. So that means that this molecule is polar. Carbon dioxide, it has polar bonds. So we're looking at the difference between carbon and oxygen, polar bonds. But this is a symmetrical molecule. We don't have any lone pairs on carbon. And the types of atoms attached to carbon are the same. They're both oxygens. And so that means that this is going to be a nonpolar molecule because it doesn't fit into both categories. This one we have CCl4 and CH2Cl2. So if we look at the first one, we definitely have polar bonds. We have a carbon-chlorine bond, definitely polar. So these little guys, these are the dipole moments for the bonds. But this is a symmetrical molecule. There aren't any lone pairs on the carbon, and we have four chlorines surrounding that carbon. So because of that, this is a non-polar molecule. Down here, this is, is a measurement of that dipole moment, and because it's zero, that's telling us that it is also nonpolar or doesn't have a dipole. And then the last example, CH2Cl2. So again, we have polar bonds, but this time we have an unsymmetrical shape because we have two chlorines and two hydrogens. So it's not surrounded by the same thing. Now one, one way I want to draw this and point out, even if you draw this like this, it looks symmetrical on paper. Remember this is not a flat structure. It has this tetrahedral shape, which is kind of represented over here. So because of that, it is going to be 
a polar molecule. Now, the blue arrows are still representing the dipole moments for the bonds. This orange arrow is representing the dipole moment for the molecule overall. And down here, we have a dipole measurement value. Um, you don't really need to understand that. We just need to know that if it's zero, it's nonpolar, and if it's not a zero, then that means that it is a polar molecule. All right, that is it for this chapter. Thank you very much.